There's a part in the movie English English where Shri Devi's character Shashi talks about how she doesn't seek love but respect and dignity that her family had taken away from her through their sly jokes and sarcasm under the disguise of harmless love. While she manages to navigate questions of agency and communicate them with her family, women are often navigating their family's desire to protect them out of love. A rhetoric that's often used by families to discipline women, to control women and to surveil them. The idea of choice, agency and freedom which are central to feminism are completely opposite to the idea of surveillance and control. That is what we are going to talk about today. What is the relationship between feminism and privacy? There are quite a lot of myths about privacy, women's safety and a well-intentioned concern for women that we will try to burst today. Social activist and scholar Bell Hooks defines feminism as a movement to end all kinds of sexist oppression. Which means feminism is not only about women, but it's an approach and movement against all forms of oppression and inequality like caste, race, religion, sexuality, gender identity or class. In the last episode, when we talked about surveillance and privacy violations targeting the marginalized groups the most, we already spoke of things from a feminist point of view. Let's dig in more this time. While awareness around issues that plague women in India has increased, it has not led to a related decrease in the abuse and oppression faced by them. India ranks at an abysmal 148 out of 170 countries according to the Women, Peace and Security Index. So what is the solution? Well, according to the Chief Minister of Delhi, Arvind K. Jifal, the answer is to increase surveillance, which has led Delhi to be the most surveilled city in the world in terms of cameras per square mile. The patriarchal assumption is that increased surveillance will lead to an increase in security as it will allow someone, usually a male officer or a member of the family, to protect the women from harm. Here, feminist learning allows us to point out several major flaws. Firstly, increased surveillance will result in a loss of independence for the women who are being surveilled and will not result in increased security but a further violation of their rights. Secondly, the number one issue women face is domestic abuse, which this increased surveillance cannot protect them against. Less than 6% of rapes in India are by strangers, which means that an overwhelming number of these cases happen behind closed doors due to people that you're already familiar with. So then what is the point of uh, bringing dunya bhar ki facial recognition technology and location sharing apps when women aren't really safe from being harassed from their husbands, fathers, brothers, relatives or really anyone they know in the private spaces of their own homes. Thirdly, CCTVs are essentially surveillance tools which allow the patriarchal police to ensure that the normative status quo is maintained and thus it could be used to target any person who does not fall under the norm for the police such as the people belonging to the LGBTQ communities. In fact, a country that refuses to criminalize marital rape still sees women as the private property of their husbands and doesn't even acknowledge that women's safety concerns will not be solved by mass surveillance but by bringing systemic socio-political change in the country and in our mindsets. This means that just like the English English example, something bitter and disturbing like mass surveillance is yet again served to us as a delicious, protection-loving and palatable dish. Secondly, what safety means for women of privilege is very different from what safety means for women who suffer various axes of marginalization like caste, religion or sexuality. An interesting thing to look at here are safety apps. There are two really messed up things about them. One, when the app believes that you are in an unsafe situation, some of these apps, they share your data with either men in your life, the policemen or other law enforcement authorities without your knowledge. This is specially messed up for trans women and women doing sex work. Because police or law enforcement authorities are the most dangerous because they do not fit into the stereotypical definition of what a woman should be or what a woman should do. Police training mein or sensitization mein badlaav lane ke bajaye, unchecked data sharing is not something we should hail as a victory for women's safety. And even if you're okay with your data being shared like this, 
The second issue is that some of these apps use a technique called heat mapping to identify certain areas which are unsafe. This technique has inherent bias in it. For instance, areas where Muslims, DBA and men with lower economic strata live, they're usually marked as unsafe by these apps. But there's no logical reason to think that these areas would be unsafe for sure, right? Unfortunately, heat maps use the cultural biases around us to assume that these areas are unsafe. This is a big criticism of Savarna upper-class feminism as well as privacy policies and technology. That they always cater to just one community of privileged women by stereotyping and seeing other marginalized groups as suspicious, criminal or undeserving of privacy and protection. This is a real life example when the Lucknow police plan to roll out emotional recognition technology enabled CCTV cameras to alarm the authorities whenever a woman has a distressed facial expression on her face. In a time when we have women's autonomy being widely undermined by laws like love jihad and honor killing, we understand that the use of such technologies is not really helping the safety of women, but it's actually trying to keep women under the control of men. Men in their families, men in police, men in politics, men in this world. A good example of this came to light when the US media started reporting on the Supreme Court draft opinion just say US may abortion ko legalize karne wala verdict Roe v Wade got overturned. Many feminist and digital rights organizations started talking about menstruation apps and how even when women feel like they are willfully controlling what they share, the data can be used against them to keep track of pregnancy terminations and to punish them. It's an established fact that many of these period tracking apps share your data without your explicit consent with third parties like advertising companies, big tech and even social media groups like Facebook. The irony, while they market themselves to women as friend-like supporters for their reproductive health, they're really not. Apne data pe, apne body pe, apne movement pe, kisi bhi cheez pe, women ke consent ke bina, unke control ke bina act karne ko women's safety or concern nahi kaha ja sakta. The wild fact is, study after study shows that CCTVs and surveillance in public spaces doesn't even prevent crimes. They just displace them to places where there is no surveillance or less surveillance. At best, they make it slightly easier to apprehend criminals after the crime has already occurred. And their very worst, they reinforce the same old power dynamics when women who may already be suffocated by domestic abuse, talking, or for excessive control, keep being under the gaze of some form of authority like the state, the police or big tech. And these authorities where privileged men are already in positions of power will not only use surveillance as a way to treat women as objects but will also reinforce stereotypes where people coming from marginalized races, castes, religions and classes will be seen as criminals. Or in this country, if you're thinking that if there is a lot of data sharing is a good enough cost of safety, then let me tell you about a scene from the show Guilty Minds where this smart, empowered lawyer, Kashyaf, who is an educated judge, she is harassed as a child by her own uncle and despite telling her mother about it, she is forced to be for the sake of family. Can any amount of mass surveillance and privacy violation keep women safe from this patriarchal mindset? Or do we need to start thinking about how violating someone's privacy is a very big part of violating their consent and thus can never really be feminist?